Hey everybody, my name is Paul Esden Jr., a.k.a. Boy Green. I'm the New York Jets digital reporter for Heavy.com. Welcome to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash boygreen25. We've been doing this series. It's been a lot of fun where the New York Jets have signed a variety of free agents. And each free agent they signed, we're bringing on an expert from wherever they came from to learn more about them and hear some cool details. Uh, like I said, we had a great one with Akash uh, of Niner Nation uh, breaking down Lake and Tomlinson. And now... We uh, ship to the defensive side of the ball, and this time we bring in Corbin Smith, and he does so many things for the Seahawks. Let's get the list. He's a reporter for all Seahawks on SI.com and also the host of Locked on Seahawks podcast, which you can follow as well, Corbin Smith NFL at on Twitter. Corbin, what's up, man? Not much, Paul. Thanks for having me. Of course. And, uh, you know, the last time we brought you on, it was about some secondary action. So it's only natural that we continue that trend here where the Jets have signed DJ Reed Jr., uh, the cornerback uh, from the Seattle Seahawks, on a three-year deal for $33 million. Let's start contractually first. What did you make of the contract offer that he ultimately signed here with the Jets? It ultimately wasn't much more than I thought he was going to go for because the last, I'd say the last 12, 13 games that he played in last year, he played at a borderline all pro level. Maybe the interception numbers were not there, but he didn't give up any touchdowns after week four. He had a QB rating against him that was in the 60s. He had a passer completion rate that was below 50% against him. One of the lowest yards after the catch in the NFL. I mean, you name it. He was just stuffing the stat sheet with really good numbers. Just didn't have a lot of ball production. But I thought that the Seahawks, that they were going to resign him, was probably going to be in that seven to nine million dollar per year range. I don't know what the Seahawks ultimately offered him. I saw today that he basically said that it was a poor offer that he felt disrespected. So I don't know how much they ended up offering him, but. 11 million per year, a little more than maybe I anticipated, but this is a guy that's only 25 years old. He's been playing really good football the last two years. So ultimately, I'm not surprised, especially with the way corners have been getting paid, especially your young corners. They're getting good money. So this lines up fairly even with what I expected, just maybe a little more than I anticipated. Yes, uh, DJ Reed did speak to the media today. There's a couple of bites we'll be bringing up on this show, but that's one that naturally comes up after this, where he was asked about, you know, did the Seahawks leave the door open for you, DJ? And uh, what'd you think? And he was blunt. He said he felt disrespected by their offer. And actually, it was, you know, somewhat touching. He said, I really wanted to stay. I felt great there. I felt like the scheme was good. I felt like the environment and everything was good. But he said the offer was disrespectful. And he said, the real reason I left is simple. Uh, it was the money. The money simply wasn't there uh, for him. So, man, it's it feels kind of bad for him that, uh, again, he loved the opportunity. And let's kind of talk about that path real quick because, obviously, there's the Robert Sala connection. He crossed over with him when uh, Robert Sala was in San Francisco. Ultimately, he gets injured and then un ends up in Seattle. Kind of tell us a little bit of that path there and how Seattle was able to kind of take a chance after the injury, and obviously it paid some dividends. This was one of the craziest stories that I've gotten to cover that I when you know since I've been on the Seahawks beat because he tore his pectoral muscle working out in I believe it was early July wow. and before the 2020 season. So typically when a guy suffers that type of an injury at that time of the year on the calendar, good luck seeing him on the field the upcoming season. So the 49ers believed we can cut this guy because of his injury. Nobody's going to claim him off waivers because he's he's not going to play this year. We can sneak him on injured reserve after he clears waivers, and then we'll have him back next year. Well, Josh Schneider had other plans. This is a player that he liked coming out of Kansas State. So with it being a division rival on top of that, let's go get this player. Maybe we can have him contribute at some point this year. He ended up only missing, I believe, seven games before he came back. And I didn't think he was going to be playing on the outside because he's a smaller corner and Seattle's typically liked long, tall corners on the outside, but they've kind of changed that the last couple of years. And DJ Reed was the guy that kind of ushered in that movement because he checks off every other box. He might not have long arms. He might not be tall, but he plays with physicality for his size. He's got quick feet. He's able to play zone and man coverage. And the Seahawks were able to figure that out quickly. They also figured out he's a really good special teams player, too. They didn't use him in that capacity this past season. But in 2020, he was returning punts, and he was a dynamic punt return. So uh, this is a guy that brings a lot of different intangibles to the table, really skillful player. And he was a 
treasure to follow as well, being a beat reporter. I He was one of my favorite interviews on the team. Just a really personable guy, always was real about everything. And so I know that a lot of his teammates out here in Seattle, and I know the media out here in Seattle, many of us were disappointed to see that he was gone just because the story, it was, it was a heck of a uh, – Heck of a rena- – what word am I looking for here? Heck of a renaissance project for them. A guy that really um, just turned the corner and really developed the last two years into a quality starter in the NFL when they just kind of took a flyer on him off waivers, didn't even know if he was going to play in 2020. Yeah, that's pretty wild. And, again, we've only had a small taste, us being the Jets media, have only had a small taste of DJ so far. But one of the – again, because we're doing all the – we're doing the same thing we're doing right now, a lot of video interviews. It, it's just kind of the nature of the beast in this uh, COVID world that we're in. Uh, one of the reporters was asking him a question, and DJ, like, almost cut him off and said, whoa, you got a lot of books. Where are you at, a library? And just start asking the reporter about what he has going on in his life. It, he seems like a super inquisitive guy. Another thing he seems is confident. That, again, oh, yeah. I, I'd, I'd only known him for minutes, but immediately this is what he said. I wanted to pull up this quote. He says, I think it's obvious I'm a CB1. And he said, I know people bring up my size, five foot nine, 188 pounds for those counting at home, but my stats compare to Jalen Ramsey, uh, AJ Terrell, JC Jackson. Look at the stats, watch the tape. And I'm just like, whoa, okay, this guy's got some bravado and confidence to him. And he should. I, I just I mentioned it a few minutes ago, Paul, he was as good. He was on the level of those guys. Maybe didn't have the interceptions. He used to have two picks last year. Maybe didn't have the pass to defense. That's the only argument you can make. The ball production wasn't necessarily there, but limiting opposing quarterbacks to under 50% completion rate and having such a low passer rating against him and one of the higher graded cover corners on pro football focus for the last 12 games of the season. I mean, he was just fantastic. And the other thing that he does that really is surprising with his size is he is going to come up and he'll thump you. He is a good run defender. He will come up and make tackles. And that is kind of a prerequisite to play corner for the Seahawks. You better be a willing tackler. DJ Reed will go out there and he'll make plays. He can play in the slot if you need him to. And so, yeah, I wouldn't sit here and say, oh, he's the next Jalen Ramsey or whatever, because obviously he's a different skill set, you know, different type of player, not that elite talent, but he is a very good corner. And statistically, he did stack up with those elite guys. Aside from the ball production, everything else was in line. He was fantastic for the Seahawks for the last three quarters of the season last year. And he was really good at the end of 2020 as well. Everybody, stop what you're doing. Make sure you like the video and hit the subscribe button down for lo- uh, below for more content like this in the cool series. And, of course, follow Corbin Smith uh, on Twitter, at Corbin Smith uh, NFL. Some great stuff there. Let me uh, bring this up. Connor Hughes of The Athletic, a great reporter. We've had him on the show before. He's fantastic. He said one of his sources, both from the Jets and Seattle, texted him and said uh, that uh, his, DJ Reed's ceiling is, quote, a really good number two. Now, DJ must have caught wind of that because he brought that up during the press conference so he seems like a guy that kind of reads and absorbs information that's out there he does so corbin is he a number one corner can he be that because that's what the jets have right now before dj re came they seem like they have a lot of really good number twos and threes but there doesn't seem to be a clear alpha dog number one in the mix is dj that i think he can be again he's only 25 years old i would say the only thing that could hold him back from being that caliber of a player has been the durability aspect. He did miss a few games last year. He's gotten banged up time to time, had that pectoral injury, a smaller corner, uh, but he does so many things well in terms of technique and using his footwork. And he's just a good football player. Like I said, he's a, he's a grinder. He's a blue collar guy, loves to put the work in. He'll come up and he'll hit you. He plays physical coverage. He can handle man responsibilities. That's what. That's one reason I was somewhat surprised the Seahawks didn't apparently offer him more money because they're going to be playing more man this year, according to their new defensive coordinator, Clint Hurt. And I thought that DJ Reed was a natural fit for that. But Sidney Jones, they were able to re-sign him, and they feel like he fits that. They were able to bring him back for significantly cheaper on a one-year deal. So ultimately, that might have been what ended up going into their thinking. They had other needs to address. I don't know all the details behind that. And again, I don't know how much that they offered him that he viewed as a disrespectful offer. But knowing DJ Reed again, he keeps things real. So I would anticipate that they weren't anywhere close to the Jets' offer, even though John Schneider tried to hint yesterday that it was similar to Shaquille Griffin last year and it was a close down to the wire offer. 
DJ Reed's comments suggest that was not the case. So let's talk about the size for a second, because we've been kind of dancing around it the entire time. I'll be honest, again, perception, when you see five foot nine, 188 pounds, oh great, we got a good slot corner. Nice. And the people interpret it the same way when the Jets drafted Brandon Eccles last year, they looked at the size and said, Oh, smaller corner, he's an he's an inside guy. But actually, Brandon Eccles was a boundary corner. And it seems like the same for DJ. So he is not a slot guy. He is a pure outside corner despite the size. He can play both. He can okay. play slot in a pinch. Uh, he actually started at the slot corner position for the Seahawks when he first started playing for them two years ago. And then they had some injuries to guys on the outside that forced him to move out to the boundary. And then he was really good out there. So they ended up just keeping him there. <laughs> and then last season, he started on the left side. I will say that he, if the New York Jets, if they're playing this right, he needs to be the right cornerback. Because for whatever reason, the first three games last year, he did not look like the DJ Reed we were used to. He just looked uncomfortable. It's like pitching left-handed. He just did, did not look comfortable out there on the left side. He gave up a couple touchdowns. Granted, it was against the Vikings, and Justin Jefferson's a fantastic receiver. So the matchup was tough. But once they moved him back to the right side, it's like the light switch came back on. That's where he is comfortable playing on the right side, out by the boundary. And he was just fantastic for the rest of the season. So... He makes up for that size with his other skills. Like I said, he checked off every other box that Pete Carroll likes to look for at the corner position. He just didn't have the look. He didn't have the long arms, and he didn't have the six foot, six foot two height, but he had everything else that the Seahawks were looking for. So you're seeing a lot of smaller corners having success on the outside in this league. He plays bigger than his size, and so I anticipate that this is going to be a good move for the Jets. It's going to work out well, especially with him having a relationship already with Robert Sala. I think it's going to be a seamless transition for him. That's a beautiful segue because that's something I pulled. I was taking notes during his press conference, and he said, don't worry, I'll be playing on the right side. So that was something that he said. Can you explain to our listeners? Because, like, again, and we explained this. Actually, it's kind of interesting because uh, Lakin Tomlinson, when we had a Kosh on, Lakin Thompson, his entire career in the NFL has been a left guard, but with the Jets, he's going to have to flip to uh, the right side. He kind of explained that to our listeners, why it's not just a Madden switch. It's the same exact thing from left guard to right guard. Can you explain that in layman's terms from left corner, right corner, and why that's a big difference and why that's actually not just, hey, just flip over there. It's the same thing. Well, I think that it just boils down to, for one thing, this is going to sound silly, and and I never played corner, so I can't speak to the specifics on it, but... I remember, I'm pretty sure that Reed actually is a player that mentioned this, that Mm -hmm. some of it is you're looking over the quarterback, you're looking a different direction, and it just changes the way that you're mirroring receivers. Even though the technique is the same, Mm -hmm. you're using your footwork and your hand placement and stuff. All that stuff is different. And you talk to offensive linemen, you hear a lot of the same stuff from guys that try to move from right tackle to left tackle. Some guys, it's a really easy adjustment. Others, it's not. And... I don't think going to left corner did DJ Reed any favors. And I I don't know necessarily what it was about that move that was a struggle for him. Uh, But I would anticipate that a lot of it just has to do with familiarity and technique. And those are things that take time when you're not used to playing on one side. And so, again, those are very generic, uh, you know, looks at the position. I didn't play corner. I didn't coach corner. But I can remember Pete Carroll and DJ Reed talking about that, that, you know, there there are differences, even just the fact that, oh, I'm looking at the quarterback this direction instead of this way, that alters your back pedal, it yeah. alters your other footwork, your ability to press. And so I just anticipate that was something he just wasn't comfortable with. Maybe if he had a few more games there, he would have been fine, but he definitely was not playing at the same level. And then he moved back to the right side and suddenly he was back to 2020 DJ Reed. If it works, don't, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it's working, don't break it. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, here's another one. I found this note in Mike Clay's notebook when he was just kind of generally talking about, uh, you know, all the teams that are pretty improved effort for agency. He said actually that DJ is a converted safety. Uh, Did he do a little bit? Where is that from? Where's that history? So I believe the 49ers, when they first drafted him, they were using him as a safety. He played corner at the college level at Kansas State. And so Robert Sala was using him in that capacity. And some of it was the 49ers had some pretty good outside corners there for a couple of years. Uh, Richard Sherman obviously was one sure, of them. Right. Playing there. So there wasn't a spot for him on the outside. And I don't know that anybody realized how good he was going to be on the outside. The Seahawks certainly didn't know that. They were forced into putting him out there because they had injuries. 
And it turned out to be a blessing in disguise for them. Sure. So, uh, yeah, he played some safety. He was a key special teams guy, returned punts and kicks. As I mentioned, he did that for the Seahawks a little bit too, two years ago. So I don't think he's going to be doing that with the money the Jets are going to be paying him. But he's a guy who can do a lot of different things. He's just a darn good football player. Cordman, before we get you out of here, is there anything else we missed? And I, I'm glad I asked this question last time because uh, Akash had so many stories apparently to tell about then Lake and Tomlinson and all kinds of things from the locker room and everything else. Is there anything else here we haven't addressed on DJ Reed that Jet fans should know whether on or off the football field about him? I think I've covered most of the bases because, again, when when I've had a chance to interview him the couple of years I've been on the beat, I just uh, this is a kid that's just – He's got some really interesting stories. And I remember when we had the uh, My Cleats uh, program this year. Yes, yes. That he, I, I believe his father has MS, I believe, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. But uh, he was talking to us about that being the foundation that he had and how he was wanting to raise awareness for his father's condition. And he opened up about the difficulties that his father has to deal with. And you know, there are other players that are like that, but again, I, he just, he always was real with us and he always shared these really interesting stories. And you could tell that he was one of those players that he cared about getting to know the people they were interviewing him too. I remember having a chat with him in training camp and he started asking me, I was talking about, you know, do you prefer mirror step versus kick step and some of these other things. And then he started asking me, hey, did you play corner? I said, no, I never played it in my life, but I'm trying to learn about it. And we ended up talking about running back and a few other positions. So he's he's always been a guy. And again, I've only interviewed him a handful of times. He's been with the team with, the, with us for a couple of years, but uh, he's just always been very open, a really neat guy. And he is, again, you mentioned it, he is very confident, but he has backed that up, at least in Seattle, every time that they needed him to do something for him whether it was special teams sliding from the slot to the outside, taking on receivers six inches taller than he always took on the challenge and he delivered. He was one of their bright spots on defense the last couple of years. And uh, they're going to have some big shoes, even though he's not a big guy, they're going to have some big <laughs> shoes that they got to fill there at one of those starting cornerback spots this season with him now going to New York. Corbin, this was a fun interview, man. I always love catching up. You've got such an interesting background for all the fans that are listening, because you know what? I'm going to go out on a limb here, Corbin, and say this is not the last interview we're going to do. There's a weird Jet Seahawks pipeline that won't die. There, so there, there seems to be, to yeah. Play. I mean, whether it was signing Brandon Shell or trading yeah. for Jamal Adams, you know and now yeah. DJ Reed, George Fant. I mean, there, yeah. there has been a Jet Seahawks pipeline, so – which, by the way, just a quick kind of detour. Again, this is all about DJ Reed. How surprised were you that the Jets take a flyer on George Fant? It was actually Joe Douglas got ripped for the move, by the way. When he grabbed George Fant instead of Jack Conklin, who was the more pronounced right tackle at the time, Joe Douglas got ripped apart uh, in free agency. Oh, what a dumb move. Who the hell is George Fant? And actually, he's turned out to be a phenomenal fit and looked great even when he flipped to left tackle. How surprised are you as a Seahawks guy that kind of had George Fant up close and personal that he he actually had this in him. I'm not surprised because when George Fant came into the league, he had never played offensive line at any level of football. <laughs> this was a basketball player at Western <laughs> Kentucky. And he, it became a running joke that if we didn't hear number 74 is now eligible, we're like, what's going on? Because they were running <laughs> six, six offensive linemen constantly. And then he caught a pass, which I'm telling you, Paul, he would have gotten 20, 25 yards on that play, and he tripped over the turf about oh, eight the years. turf monster the first down mark. The turf monster got him. Yeah, he he was a lot of fun to cover. And then he had a year he missed with the torn ACL, and it's unfortunate because I don't think if he missed that season, he might still be in a Seahawks uniform. Wow. They they might have done some different things at left tackle. That's what necessitated trading for Dwayne Brown because he got hurt. And they didn't have him. They they thought he might be their future left tackle. So he's a guy that came in extremely raw. And now that he's played a lot of football and he's an incredible athlete from his basketball background, I'm not surprised that he's having success. And I'm not surprised the Jets paid him money. He's a guy that I thought was going to have a pretty healthy market because he had a lot of upside that was untapped coming from Seattle. Yeah, phenomenal. Well, Corbin, again, thanks for the stories. Let everyone know where they can follow you and follow your work. Because like I said, I think we'll be doing a few more of these here in the future with this pipeline here. Where can people follow you and find your work? 
You can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can visit our website, si.com slash NFL slash Seahawks. It's all Seahawks now. Previously was Seahawk Maven rebranded recently. And you can find Locked On Seahawks, our five days a week podcast. It's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. And we are now doing video casts five days a week available on YouTube. Beautiful. Uh, Phenomenal, Corbin. Thank you so much for joining us. A super fun conversation. And we'll do this in the future. Thanks, brother. Sounds good. Take care.